Well, uh, welcome to everybody who's joined us this afternoon for what's already been a great day, I have to say, and I'm expecting a wonderful, wonderful next two hours with our guest speaker. I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Nadia Alali, who is a professor of gender studies in the Center for Gender Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, University of London. Professor Alali's main research interests involve gender theory, feminist activism, women and gender in the Middle East, transnational mi uh, migration and diaspora mobilization, war, conflict, and reconstruction. And she's done anthropological research on these topics in a variety of places, including Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, as well as the United Kingdom and the United States. Professor Alali is the author of many path-breaking books, several of which I have to say I've used with great success in my graduate course on culture and politics in the contemporary Middle East. Um, I would say her, the two books that maybe she's best known for are Iraqi Women, Untold Stories from 1948 to the Present, and What Kind of Liberation, Women and the Occupation of Iraq. But she has a number of other volumes and collections, including Women in War in the Middle East, Transnational Perspectives, New Approaches to Migration, Secularism, Gender, and the State in the Middle East, and Gender Writing, Writing Gender. Her most recent book, which is co-edited with Deborah al najjar is entitled We Are Iraqis, Aesthetics and Politics in a Time of War. Professor Alali was president of JMUSE's parent organization, the Association of Middle East Women's Studies, or AMUSE, from, 19, uh, from 2009 to 2011. And I have to say, Nadia, I think you were one of the very best AMUSE presidents ever. She was an activist president, which is what we want. Yay. And you know, since that time, she's been very actively involved with our journal, JMUSE. Um, she's an associate editor of JMUSE since 2009. Recently, she's been elected to the Board of Directors of the Middle East Studies Association, or MESA. And on her more activist, sort of her activist credentials, she's a member of the Feminist Review Collective and a founding member of ACT Together, Women's Action for Iraq. Currently, she's facilitating the introduction of women's and gender studies into Iraqi higher education while working with Iraqi women's rights activists in increasing the capacity for evidence-based research in that country. And I have to say, literally, I got this on email yesterday. As I said in my introduction this morning, um, AMUSE started out not with our journal, JMUSE, but with a, a, a hard copy bulletin of member news. And we decided, and it kind of got lost a little bit over the years, but in this past year, under the presidency of Hoda Asada, we've started up an, an e-journal, an e-bulletin. It's called AMUSE e-bulletin. Um, Nadia just wrote an, a brilliant overview that I read this morning, and I highly recommend it. It's in the April 2013 issue of Amuse E. Bolton called 10 Years After the Invasion, What Happened to Iraqi Women? Um, very compelling analysis about some losses, a few gains, but mostly how women's um, activism and gender issues sort of got swept under the carpet in the past decade. And so she's, as you can see, there's some, several thematics to her work, but she's really been one of the only, really, I would say, um, feminist writers, Middle East women's studies scholars, really working on Iraq. Um, you know, we turn to her work in, in that regard, but she's also interested in these more general issues of gender and activism across the, the region. And so we are very delighted to introduce this extraordinary scholar and activist who will be speaking to us about gendering rage, protest, cultural productions, and the making of new men and women in the Middle East. So we welcome Professor Nadia Alali. Thank you very much, Marsha. I'm really happy to be here, and I would like to thank Jim Hughes, particularly Marsha, and of course also very much Bonnie Rose for inviting me and for organizing this excellent workshop today. And I would also like to take the opportunity to, ta to thank both Marsha and Bonnie Rose for the amazing work you have been doing for JMUs. And I feel very happy and proud with the quality of the journal, which has really gone from strength to strength. And I'm really honored to be here today. Now, when uh, Marsha and uh, Bonnie Rose asked me about a theme for today's workshop, I um, strongly felt that activism <coughs> should feature prominently. And uh, what I had in mind was not only activism with respect to the Middle East, so us speaking about activism in the region, but what I also wanted to do was to actually uh, create a space in which we can talk about the productive but also sometimes tense relationship between 
scholarship, academia, and activism. <coughs> now, for me, academia and um, activism are actually inseparable and combine in interesting and complex ways. Researching on action, being simultaneously a researcher and activist, being an activist reflecting on action. Now, I'm not keen on reproducing a dichotomy of theoretical versus political, as I do see theory, politics, and praxis closely intertwined and constitu constitutive of each other. However, I think it would be disingenuous to not mention that activism and academia do each carry their own set of rules, requirements and trials, and that these are not always in harmony with each other. So, I mean, what I'm thinking about here are, for instance, you know, research emphasis and focus, the methods of research, what and where to publish, in which contexts, and how to engage with the public, particularly in terms of language, emphasis and tone. And I should say, when I look at um, my PhD that was published at the time, when I read it now, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, oh my god, this is so jargony. But it was a kind of rite of passage, and I feel now, I have to say, I feel much more free uh, to not use jargon. Um, and I think that having worked on Iraq and Iraqi women, I think it would have been unethical if I just written to the 20, 30 experts in the field. I think it was really important for me to try to write, to find a way to speak in a language uh, that is more accessible and also to speak to different, in different contexts. Having said that, I don't think that it's uh, mutually exclusive. I think it is important to theorize and I, I think it's also important to um, maybe sort of push boundaries a bit further, but I think for me this has been a dialective process. <coughs> now, academic standards call for great rigor if the research is not to come across like mere partisan storytelling. At the same time, as my friend and colleague Cynthia Coburn has argued on numerous occasions, politically, we need to be profoundly responsible towards co-activists if we aren't to exploit them in the interests of our academic careers. We also know that it is not only academics, but also activists who can build useful knowledge, even theory. And then again, too, out of theory can come progressive change. Interestingly, and I'm, um, I would uh, like to maybe have a discussion with you about this, I find that it is mainly in the United States that people ask me, how can you combine academia and activism? It doesn't happen so much in other contexts. And so I, I would like to know from you, maybe in the discussion later on, why you think that is. I should also say that I originally uh, meant to focus more specifically on revolutionary and counter-revolutionary processes in the region. Um, as you notice, I'm not using the term Arab Spring, and I'm not only using not I'm not using it not only because of the spring bit, but also because of the Arab bit. Um, you know, I think that it really sort of glosses over <coughs> the uh, diversity of. Um, ethnic groups in the context I've been working is actually Kurds in the north of Iraq who have been very much, maybe even more, engaged in protest movements and they obviously don't like to be subsumed <laughs> under the term Arab Spring. Um, but um, I decided that given the historical significance and developments in Iraq, I'm speaking here about the 10th anniversary, anniversary of the invasion and the ongoing and acute political crisis and lack of security and you know, regular bombings, as well as increased gender-based violence. What I want to do instead, not instead, but I'm sort of slightly shifting here, is to talk to you about a series of issues that emerged initially in the context of my work and activism in and on Iraq, but as I will argue, are also relevant when we look at current developments in the region and most particularly Egypt. I'm particularly sort of thinking about Egypt and that's because of my personal connection to Egypt. I lived in Cairo for five years. I was involved in the Egyptian women's movement and I did my PhD on the Egyptian women's movement. More specifically, I intend in this talk to reflect on rage 
as a productive and creative effect and force that is gendered and gendering. I will argue that part of the tensions, violence and conflict is linked to the contestations of new femininities and masculinities in a context where, as Denise Candiotti has eloquently argued, we cannot talk about a routine manifestation of patriarchy given the revolutionary challenges to the states and hegemonic norms of masculinity and femininity. I would also like to share with you my <coughs> thoughts about the positionality of rage and knowledge production and the difficulties of being truly intersectional in our rage, activism and scholarship. Now, uh, let me start first uh, by reading an excerpt of um, the edited volume that was recently published um, via Iraqis, Politics and Aesthetics in a Time of War. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the book in a moment, but I... Now, uh, the image you see here is of uh, Wifa Bilal, he is an Iraqi multimedia artist based at NYU. And he engaged in a month-long performance art piece called Domestic Tension, where he was based in a Chicago gallery with a paintball gun aimed at him that people could shoot over the internet. I quote, <coughs> That day, in May 2007, the paintball shots were particularly fast and furious and psychologically debilitating. The story had been featured on dick.com, so people from all over the world were visiting the site and, fire and firing at me. The anonymity fostered brutal, viciously xenophobic and racist comments and naked aggression. That day, the non-stop barrage of shots and highly disturbing volley of often violent and humiliating chat room messages forced me to take matters in my own hands. I disconnected the paintball gun without the viewer's knowledge and then, in an Oscar-worthy performance, acted like a terrified man under fire. The room was so soaked in yellow paint from the deluge of paintballs that viewers could not tell that the gun was not firing. I acted like I was badly hurt from being hit by a paintball and exited the room. The next day, I found the chat room was a bus with rumors that I had been taken to the hospital. I felt a sense of triumph over my traumatists. I was able to take control of the image and use it to my own ends. Now, on various levels, domestic tension is a prime example of using art to get people to examine their own attitudes, prejudices, lives and behaviors. Domestic tension is also a very powerful example of the transformative power of rage and creativity. Wifa Bilal's installation and performance not only forced participants to confront their own violence, aggression and dehumanizing behavior, but it also empowered the artist to take control, to hold an invisible mirror in, mirror in front of the thousands who happily participated in violating him in very similar ways that people were, had been watching and cheering the bombing of Baghdad and other Iraqi cities in 1991 and 2003. <coughs> now, as I mentioned earlier, Wafa Bilal's reflections on art is part of a wider project I've been working on. Collecting contributions by Iraqi artists, writers, filmmakers, poets, photographers, bloggers, and so on. This illusioned by either institutionalized politics or militant resistance, I have been increasingly looking to cultural expressions and cultural productions as arenas of nonviolent resistance and of innovation, inspiration, vision, and hope. Now, Iraq has become <coughs> a case of worst scenario come true with a toxic mix of Western military and political intervention, opportunistic diaspora politics, the emergence of a new dictatorship, as well as a reinvigoration of an authoritarian political culture. 
At the same time, we find an increasing significance of fiercely conservative <coughs> Islamist political groups, increasing gender-based violence, and the lack of basic infrastructure. Yet, my dis disillusionment with former party politics and established political channels extends to the revolutionary processes we have seen unfolding in other countries in the region. More specifically, I've been following events in Egypt, and at this point I should insert that I find it absolutely necessary, as some of you already mentioned before, to historicize and also to be very specific when talking about the gendered implications of revolutionary and counter-revolutionary processes. Now, while I do believe in the power and need of political mobilization through various groups and organizations, while I see street politics as playing an important role in terms of revolutionary processes, but also wider political developments, I'm increasingly drawn to those spaces outside of conventional political practices and mobilization. One of the lessons I learned in Iraq, and I see currently unfolding in Egypt as well, is that established and even most new political parties are modeled on authoritarian and hierarchical structures, patriarchal norms and relations, and even if women might be involved and they seem to lack in the mechanisms and structures that allow for creative and inspiring energies and ideas to flourish. Now we are stuck with political parties and I'm not suggesting that we'll get rid of them anytime soon. But in terms of actual change and more deep-seated transformations, I would, um, I'm interested to look at political culture rather than parties. Political culture is about the way we do politics, how we relate to each other, how we generate ideas and make decisions. Political culture refers to the distinguishing beliefs, attitudes, habits and behavior patterns that characterize a political community. It is made up of cognitive, affective, and evaluative orientations towards a political system. <coughs> Crucially, it is a creation of alternative spaces and alternative means of doing politics that carries the po possibility of more profound change and transformation. And this is where imagination, writing, music and art are absolutely key. It is in the sphere of cultural productions, whether in more conventional art forms linked to theater, film, music, literature, <coughs> paintings, photography, and so on, or in new cultural expressions linked to graffiti art, uh, graffiti art, hip hop, and blogging, that cultural spaces and productions can challenge the very basis of how we think of and do politics in any given context. Now, this is not to reduce art and cultural productions to didactic tools for politics and education. I think that functionalist approach to culture uh, and art is far too limiting, simplistic and linear. But I'm thinking of the relation between subcultures and alternative cultural spaces and the emergence of alternative oppositional cultures. Now within the wider field of uh, political culture, I've been now for some time interested in the productive potential of rage. And we've heard about rage earlier on. Karina, I don't know where she is. Oh, that's a shame. Um, now, rage, which is one of the many concrete sentiments and manifestations of an intensification of feeling, an intens intensification of discomfort, what cultural studies scholars call an effective response that might or might challenge or reproduce existing social orders. Affect, as the feminist theorist Claire Hemmings tells us, broadly refers to states of being rather than to their manifestations or interpretations as emotions. Now I should say I'm not an expert in affect theory, nor have I been engaged in debates around the affective turn. However, I do find it useful to think about emotional investments, political connectivity and the possibility of change, while recognizing that affects are clearly embedded within specific historical, social, political, and economic contexts, but cannot simply be reduced to them. At the same time as we should allow in our analysis 
for a level of individuality and idiosyncrasies and not reduce people to categories, I would like to stress that affects and their associated emotions <coughs> such as rage take on collective lives and dynamics, become contagious and intensify in crowds. Now my personal history of rage has many sources and, both in, is, and is rooted both in individual and collective experiences. The pressure to integrate and be more German than the Germans, as you see from my accent is still there, <laughs> when growing up, um, atrocities committed against my family and friends by the regime of Saddam Hussein, the invasion of Kuwait in 1990, the Gulf War of 1991, a devastating sanctions regime <coughs> against Iraq for 13 years, the invasion of Iraq 10 years ago, occupation and its link chaos, lawlessness, violence, human rights abuses. But rage has also grown in the context of wider <coughs> policies linked with the so-called war on terror, racism, and more specifically, Islamophobia. But that's not all. A gender-based rage has taken up a big chunk of my emotional and political being. It was in Cairo in the late 80s and early 90s that entered the world of feminist activism through Egyptian friends who took me to meetings and soon got me hooked. Feminist scholarship provided me with the vocabulary and concepts to put words to phenomena and processes that I was observing or had experienced myself. Um, and experiences that related to gender-based discriminations, inequalities, overt and more subtle forms of sexism, misogyny, as well as homophobia. Now, in the late uh, 1990s, I met with a group of Iraqi and British-based women's rights activists and started a group called um, Act Together Women Against Sanctions on Iraq. I mean, that was the initial name, <coughs> and then we had to change it to act together, women against sanctions and war in Iraq. And then uh, <laughs> later on, we just called it act together, um, women's action for Iraq. Now, we spent the first couple of years trying to educate people in Britain and other Western countries about the devastating impact of economic sanctions on the Iraqi population. But particularly focusing on the impact on women and gender relations in terms of both the humanitarian crisis but also more restrictive gender norms. Aside from the most obvious and devastating effects of sanctions related to dramatically increased child mortality rates, widespread malnutrition, deteriorating health care and general infrastructure, as well as unprecedented poverty and an economic crisis, women were particularly hit by a changing social climate. State discourse and policies as well as social attitudes and gender ideologies shifted dramatically during the sanctions period. In late 2001, we had to widen our focus and started to campaign against the British and American invasion of Iraq. From the beginning, we made it clear that we opposed both the repressive Ba'ath regime and American and British policies on Iraq. Loud demonstrations, silent vigils, sit-ins and teach-ins were part of our political repertoire. <coughs> now in March 2003, we mounted an exhibition called Our Life in Pieces, Objects and Stories from Iraqis in Exile at a gallery in central London. Our main motivation at the time was to dispel the idea that Iraq could be equated with Saddam Hussein. Before 2003, hardly anyone ever talked about Iraq in terms of ordinary human beings, their fears, hopes, and aspirations. We issued, an, we issued an invitation to Iraqis in exile to contribute objects which held a particular meaning for them. Repositories of personal, familial, and social memory and history. Emblems, talismans, anything they wanted to exhibit which had some sort of symbolic value for them in terms of the connection um, to Iraq. Now initially women seemed more willing to contribute objects and write their personal accounts than men, who often said they hadn't brought anything with them. We also had to work hard to gain people's trust. The painful recent history of the country had left Iraqis very wary. <coughs> 
Once this barrier was crossed, however, they became intrigued and enthusiastic, and up to the opening of the exhibition, people were still contact contacting us, wanting to bring in their objects and stories. In the end, we had about 75 exhibits, and um, so people not only gave an object, but they also wrote a story about it, you know, why it is they chose this. Now, the opening of the exhibition in March 2003 coincided with the invasion of Iraq. The exhibition became a gathering point for many Iraqis who feared for their relatives' and friends' lives. We felt incredibly helpless, sad and angry, but we also knew that we were making a very small contribution to reminding people in Britain that a military intervention was affecting real people on the ground as well as people living in the diaspora. We also felt that we were transforming our rage into something creative and constructive. Now, my own personal trajectory of anger, frustration and political activism is not unique in that one rage tends to bleed into another. The moment we recognize that social injustices, inequalities, human rights violations and different forms of oppression are all linked and interconnected. In gender theory, of course, we speak of intersectionality, the fact that gender as a social category marking unequal power relations and hierarchies intersects with other markers of difference and inequality, such as ethnicity, race, class, religion, sexuality, and so on. Now, when we make these connections, it becomes impossible, and now I'm sort of bringing it back to uh, processes in the region, then it becomes impossible to not link revolutionary struggles for the wider good and the nation with those of marginalized groups within, and vice versa. I personally could not have advocated for women's rights in Iraq over the past few years without also mobilizing against neo-colonialist and imperialist policies and processes, as well as against political authoritarianism of Iraqi politicians. Unfortunately, not everyone who has been agitating against US and UK intervention and policies feels that gender-based rights and violence are part of their struggle. Through political activism and engagement with theory, I developed my political practices as a feminist in conjunction with the struggle against racism, imperialism, economic exploitation and heteronormativity and the attempt to find non-hierarchical and non-violent ways of resisting these various forms of intersecting hierarchies and inequalities. Now this has been coined transnational feminist politics and praxis. Now, a transnational feminist politics is in reality in everyday life, however, often very difficult and requires painful decisions and turmoil. The tension between the need to address women's rights and fight racism and Islamophobia are particularly acute in the context of the Middle East and the so-called Muslim world. And I will look at this tension later on. Now, coming back to intersectionality, as both an analytical tool, but also a political practice, most Iraqi women's rights activists did not have to read any gender theory to realize that their struggle for increased gender equality and social justice is closely linked with the struggle against sectarianism, corruption and authoritarianism. In Egypt, an intersectional approach was initially rejected by revolutionary activists, most anyway, including many women activists themselves. In the first phase of the revolution, many women's rights activists and Copts as well were accused of sidelining the main issue, of neglecting their national duties and betraying the nation and the revolution. I'm thinking here, for example, about um, you know, the first International Women's Day in Cairo 2011, when um, the small number of women who came together to celebrate International Women's Day were harassed and accused of taking away attention from the main issues. Some men who attacked the female protesters claimed that they were seeking to destroy Egypt and undermine family values and the sanctity of the family by telling women to desert their husbands. In this instance, it was obvious that the men surrounding them were divided into those who felt threatened by a woman's block making their own demands and thereby challenging the prevailing gender order, 
and those who stood in solidarity with them, <coughs> recognizing that the women's demands were at the core of their own vision and ideas of a new Egypt. Now don't get me wrong, I don't want anyone to fall back into the trap of identity politics in which communities or genders become essentialized and reified, represented by so-called community leaders who might not actually represent the diverse positions of any given group of people. I'm not advocating a politics based on difference and identity alone. But I would argue that any revolutionary struggle for the nation as a whole, similar to radical political transformation or transition as we're witnessing in Iraq today, needs to accommodate the struggle for its most marginalized members, whether based on gender, class, religion or sexuality. And I would add that any hegemonic narrative about the nation needs to be challenged, disrupted and creatively subverted as part of a revolutionary struggle for a more just and equal society. Unfortunately, all cross-cultural and historical evidence suggests <coughs> that unless women explicitly insist on their gender-specific needs, rights and problems, these will be sidelined, ignored and swept under the carpet. Now, a further lesson I've taken away from Iraq and see replicated again, maybe more so acutely in Egypt than in Tunisia, is that democracy cannot be equated with elections. Um, Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party have been ousted, yet the sharp reality is forcing people to see that it takes much more than a military invasion and a new government to establish democratic structures and tra to transform an authoritarian political culture built on patronage, connections and corruption. <coughs> there is a resilience of old patterns and structures which were put in place under the previous regime and which have not been stabilized. I'm sure this sounds familiar to many of you um, working on Egypt or Tunisia, although the means and context of, our, of ousting either Ben Ali or Mubarak were of course drastically very different from the Iraqi context. Besides elections, a democracy needs foundations such as freedom of expression, freedom of the media, a strong civil society, an independent judiciary, checks and balances and a population that is not swayed by populist slogans but is able to make educated choices. And when I say education here, I'm not necessarily speaking about school or university. But a political choice based on knowledge and insight about political tendencies, programs, policies of different parties and candidates, as well as underlying worldviews, ethics and visions. Personally, I think that democracy is an aspiration rather than a reality anywhere in the world, including in so-called Western democracies. But it is a matter of degree. Iraq, again, is an example of a country where elections were not democratizing, they were not democratizing at all, but rather institutionalized sectarianism, as people were voting along sectarian lines in a situation of insecurity, fear, and lack of services. And just because elections are held, it doesn't mean democracy is being implemented. Worse, in the absence of viable democratic foundations, elections could become a dangerous exercise and fuel political violence. In such a case, winning elections is regarded as a matter of death and life, since the winner takes it all and his power is unrestrained. It's always his power. Um, democracy is also not merely about representing the majority, but it is about assuring the rights, freedoms and safety of those parties and followers who lost or are in the minority. Democracy is about assuring that those who have different views from those who have gained political control can still be expressed without sanctions or negative consequences, except if they are inciting to hatred and violence, of course. There's a very thin line between populism and democracy that is difficult to balance. At a conference I attended last year on gender and the Arab Spring, a number of participants asked the question, is democracy bad for women? Now, I personally would not have put it this way as I don't equate elections with democracy. 
But I think that the question deserves discussion and closer, closer attention. Historically, women's rights activists in the Middle East have been challenged to not be co-opted by the largely secular authoritarian states modernizing gender policies and forms of state feminism. When dealing with a dictatorship and a one-party system, it is very difficult for women's rights activists to operate independently outside given state structures. Yet in the past, authoritarian regimes have implemented measures to increase gender equality and social justice as long as these were perceived to be harmless to the regime and the status quo. We have seen this most conspicuously in Tunisia and Iraq, but also to some extent in Egypt, where some women's rights activists collaborated with, with Suzanne Mubarak's National Union for Women. However, what also needs to be stressed is that many women's rights activists in the region, whether in Iraq, Egypt, Palestine, Iran or Tunisia, have historically been intersectional in their approach to gender-based rights and have been at the forefront of opposing political authoritarianism, economic exploitation and imperialist policies. Egyptian women's rights activists, for example, have been out on the streets to protest against Israeli occupation the US invasion of Iraq and the exploitation of factory workers. Yet despite this, the stigma and accusation of having worked closely with the previous state weighs heavily on women's rights activists and needs to be understood as a pointed strategy to discredit them. These accusations are not new, as in the past it was about imitating the West and working closely with the colonial powers only now the implications and consequences might be even more severe. Ironically, but again not surprisingly, we can see that women and gender issues are taking center stage in the old regime's attempts to hold on to power and privilege and in the violent backlash and counter-revolutionary processes we have been witnessing recently. The treatment of female protesters is taking very different forms to that of their male counterparts. One of the early analyses about the gendered implications of the revolution in Egypt has been provided by the Egyptian historian and activist Khalid Fahmi. He argued in 2012 that women's bodies had emerged as a nexus for many of the principles and objectives of the revolution. Fahmi put it the following way, I quote, the important role of women and the female body in this revolution has manifested itself under many guises. First came the photographs in the nude that Alia Mahdi posted of herself on her blog in a bold gesture to challenge existing taboos about the body and raise fundamental questions about who owns and controls it. Then came the horrific video footage of a young woman whose body was stripped of of veil and clothing, she was dragged and stomped in a naked defensiveness by army boots, and this at the doorstep of parliament and cabinet buildings. Then we watched the equally horrifying footage of Azza Hilal, who rushed to the defense of the woman in the blue bra, as the victim mentioned above, came to be famously known in the English language press, only to find her own body subjected to brutal beating, again by army soldiers. And finally, we saw tens of thousands of women taking to the streets in a mass rally of protest against the army's brutality and systematic violation of the sanctity of women's bodies. These events show that the female body is at the heart of this great revolution in which women have emerged as a driving and galvanizing force. Now, uh, much has already been said about this picture today, so I don't really want to go uh, much into it. I, I'm really sorry that Karina is not here because I um, really appreciated her analysis. I guess what I wanted to do with this picture um, was to um, sort of complicate again sort of reactions and stress the importance of context. Um, now my, um, w I, I guess one of the things that is important um, to say is that uh, both, it wasn't just um, 
you know, Islamist and sort of conservatives who reacted to it, but many sort of prog progressive secular activists also reacted to this and very much, uh, you know, were very upset and, um, you know, basically said this is not the right moment to do this and this will create a backlash. I have to say that my own initial sentiments and reactions um, very much resonate what uh, Karina was saying and um, I thought it was really very well expressed in Maya McDashi's excellent article Waiting for Alia which was published on Jadalia on the 20th of November, uh, November 2011. I will just share the concluding paragraph because I thought it was really very well put. My quote, Alia's picture does not play by the rules and this is why both liberals and Islamists have condemned her. Condemned her. She is not waiting for the right moment to bring up bodily rights and sexual rights in post-Mubarak Egypt. She's not playing nice with the patriarchal power structures in Egypt. She's not waiting her turn. Her mouth is not open and pouting. <coughs> her breasts are not large. Her eyes are not hungry or afraid. She's not wearing high heels. <coughs> her vagina is uncovered. She's not selling anything and she's not trying to turn us on. Her use of fishnet stockings appears to be a commentary on the cliché of commodified seduction. Her nudity is not about sex, but it aims to reinvigorate a conversation about the politics of sex and the uneven ways it is articulated across the fields of gender, capital and control. She is staring back at us, daring us to look at her to not turn away, daring us to have this debate. And then I was going to compare that to this picture that you've already seen, by, but I have a better uh, quality picture. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so when I saw this, uh, like um, Karina, I mean, I had a very different reaction, um, you know, to this than previous. And, you know, we've already discussed it and I actually very much agree. But I also um, would like to share some pictures of um, Feminine who then uh, uh, engaged in this topless uh, jihad. And I think um, what I guess the point that I wanted to make is that I find that um, famine and the reaction to famine is subsuming the acts of, I mean, in the sort of critique and reaction, I feel that the acts, the original acts, acts of Alia and Amina, uh, which to my mind are actually acts of bravery and politically very different from that but the reaction to that colors the way people think about um, both Alia and Amina and I what I'm asking us to do is kind of be more careful in sort of really looking more carefully at the context and the meaning and um, sort of try to disentangle that. Um, Now, similarly, I'm suggesting that we need to look at the complexities linked to the increase in sexual harassment. Easy readings either conclude that the epidemic of sexual harassment in Egypt is an indication for the fact that women's rights and spaces for women are shrinking in the current period. Others, on the, uh, others uh, point to the orchestrated nature of harassment. Now, with the surge and intensity of sexual harassment, uh, why no, oh sorry. While the surge and intensity of sexual harassment has increasingly gained attention within media and academia, as well as amongst women's and human rights activists in Egypt and elsewhere, I personally would caution against the tendency to reduce the wide range of gender developments and phenomena linked to current transformations to that of harassment. I mean, I think there's much more going on. But I would also argue that even a focus on harassment evokes a mixed picture as the widespread mobilization, campaigning and advocacy against harassment is unprecedented and has allowed for a previously sensitive issue to be addressed publicly by Egyptian women and I should stress by Egyptian men. This stands in drastic contrast to the way harassment and even wider forms of gender-based violence were previously considered a taboo subject. I remember an incident during my time of living in Cairo in the 1990s when um, the new Women's Research Center had caused an uproar uh, 
by having written a research and policy paper on gender-based violence. At the group, um, at the time, the group was harshly criticized, even by some fellow feminists, for trying to impose Western issues and problems on Egyptian society. I know that debates moved on quite a bit since the mid-90s, but um, still I think what we see right now is a, is a very um, qualitative, in terms of quality, in terms of intensity, uh, quite a big change. In Egypt today, harassment and other forms of gender-based violence are being talked about publicly and are at the core of much mobilizing, although what I'm suggesting is that the focus is on harassment in ways that is not always useful. Um, now, sexual harassment and its counterpart, women's security and ability to move safely in public spaces and participate in political activities is not anymore perceived to be the diversion from the wider revolutionary struggle for greater equality and social justice as it was initially the case. Nowadays, those parties, groups and individuals who see themselves as holding on to the spirit of the revolution, view the fight against harassment as central to the wider demands and visions for a new society. It is heartening to see the large number of men of different generations in solidarity, although young men seem to be particularly involved in anti-harassment campaigns, such as Harass Map, Operation Anti-Sexual Harassment, and Tahrir Bodyguard. Yet discourses about harassment differ greatly, ranging from conservative protection discourses, also propagated by President Morsi and conservative strands of the media and political <coughs> landscape, to the prevailing analysis of feminists and progressive political forces focusing on the authorities and um, the orchestrated nature of the attacks. Here accusations range from blaming the police, the military, remnants of the former regime and the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, whoever the main culprits are behind sexual har harassment, quite a bit of what we are witnessing in Egypt today is clearly planned and instigated. On the 25th of January this year, the second anniversary of Egypt's revolution, at least 19 women were recorded to have been sexually assaulted by gangs of men. These attacks were similar to previous assaults during protests. Large numbers of men moved jointly through crowds, working in a systematic and orchestrated way, way surrounding individual women, first in a U-shape, then fully encircling a woman in several lines of men. Victims report feeling confused by some men speaking about protection while closing in on them and attacking them in a most brutal manner, including stripping off their clothes and raping them with objects and fingers. The focus on the patterns of attacks, the systematic and apparently orchestrated nature, and the question of instigators stands in contrast to the sensationalist tone of the UK's Channel 4's documentary, Egypt, Sex Mobs and Revolution, aired in December 2012. I don't know if any one of you saw this. Um, the documentary addressed the issue of harassment, suggesting that Egyptian men had turned into uncontrolled sex-craved mobs. It made for very uncomfortable watching, especially in my living room in London, knowing exactly how much of the British public would interpret how, you know, knowing exactly how the British public would interpret um, this documentary. It was feeding right into stereotypes of violent Muslim men oppressing their women. But, and this is a sticky point for me, I have been increasingly wondering whether there is not more going on than simply state or police orchestrated harassment and violence. And I've also been wondering whether a narrow focus on harassment and gang attacks on women might be short-sighted and problematic on the long run. To my mind, there is a continuum of harassment and gender-based violence ranging from the orchestrated sexual harassment of women during protests to more spontaneous forms of harassment by groups of young men on the street and the harassment girls and women have been experienced for a long time within schools, institutions, at work, as well as within homes. I think it is important to make connections to domestic violence, marital rape, FGM, and honor-based crimes and killings. 
In addition to looking inward, I would suggest, and I know that many Egyptian feminists have already made these links for many years, that a more long-term and holistic strategy against harassment needs to include a campaign for fairer economic redistribution, and crucially, a campaign against the systematic marginalization of women in decision-making processes, both within governmental institution, institutions as well as many opposition and dissident contexts. Furthermore, and I realize that this would be extremely controversial in the Egyptian context, I would argue that capital punishment is a feminist issue. It is my feminist friends in Iraq who taught me the connections between a society that normalizes violence, whether in terms of state control or resistance to it, and the increase, and the increase in um, various forms of gender-based violence. Now, recognizing the danger of reducing complex phenomena to a crisis in masculinity, or feeding international security discourses and naturalizing class-based thuggery, as Paul Amar cautions us against, I still think that we need to think more deeply and productively about contestations of masculinities at this particular historical juncture in Iraq, in Egypt, and elsewhere in the region. The large presence of men in solidarity with uh, women is clearly a sign of changing times and for men making connections they did not do before. On the other hand, elements of the military, some political parties, the police and secret services deploy and make use of thuggish violent masculinities to assert their authority and intimidate women and men who resist. And there are many other processes and phenomena phenomena going on that require closer scrutiny, such as the celebrated militancy of ultras, the anarchic football fans, <coughs> who have been fighting elements of the police and security services during protests. And I have to say, I personally felt quite disturbed with the way that many of my friends were kind of celebrating uh, the ultras as, you know, the kind of the resistance to the state. Um, and I think in terms of, uh, you know, some of their implications, and especially in terms of uh, violence and, you know, the sort of gender norms, um, extremely problematic. Uh, other processes, uh, developments going on is the increase in social conservatism with its stress on family values and cohesion, the increased Islamization of public and political discourses, and the ongoing extreme gap in access to resources, employment, and political decision making. Now, I recognize that masculinities and femininities are always in crisis in, in some ways, and that meaning that they're always contested, polarized, struggled over, and that these crises have a lot to do with political economies, particularly in the context of Egypt. Um, and my friend Nicola Pratt, I think, made this very convincing argument in that in the Egyptian context, sort of the impact of structural adjustment and liberal, neoliberal economic policies have created a situation where uh, many Egyptian men and women, what they want is to be real men again or real women again. And it has a lot to do with the kind of uh, a glorification of a past which never was in a way, you know, where sort of women could stay at home and men could work. And it's because of economic conditions that that, that was all muddled up. And so a lot of what we see in terms of tensions links to this, you know, wanting to be real men and women again. I, but I think that while, you know, crisis is always, or contestation is always part of, uh, you know, constructions and performances, perm performativity of masculinity and femininity, I think that the level and intensity of contestations has risen considerably, as have the possibilities of reimagining and pushing boundaries. Now, this might seem contradictory and paradox given the overall shift towards more conservative gender norms and relations in some ways. Um, and these are not only pushed by Islamist political constituencies, but also by many ordinary people as well. So there is a kind of hardening of boundaries and norms going on. But at the same time, there's also, there are openings that profoundly challenge hegemonic gender norms. 
Also, I agree with Denise Condiotti that we cannot simply explain away what is happening as uh, patriarchy and misogyny um, when we look at the honing in on women's dress codes, their mobility, their sexuality, uh, their presence during protests. Um, actually, the honing in on the fact that women are political actors. I would argue that the context is radically different and, as, um, and in some ways has been getting worse some, for some time. Candiotti has introduced the term masculinist restoration to signal that when patriarchy, as usual, does no longer feel secure, it requires higher level of coercion and, as she argues, the deployment of more varied ideological state apparatuses to ensure its reproduction. And I would add that they are often playing right into the insecurities, frustrations and anger of men outside of the political elite who feel challenged by women's aspirations, activism, disobedience and desires. Now I would like to conclude with the argument that the messy and interconnected sentiments of rage translate into specific forms of activism, mobilization and academic interventions in ways that are profoundly contextual and linked to our respective positionalities. Unfortunately, much of what we do and say is defensive and reactive, often in knee-jerk manner, thereby falling into the trap of dichotomous and polarized statements and arguments that gloss over complexities and nuances. I'm thinking, for example, about Mona al tahawis article, Why Do They Hate Us? Now, there were lots of things wrong in the article, which appeared to, to blame Middle Eastern men as a group for victimizing Middle Eastern women as a group. Now, I don't want to rehearse the excellent critiques provided earlier, pointing to the historically rooted and structural, structural injustices and forms of oppression, such as colonialism, capitalism, authoritarianism, patriarchy and neoliberalism, affecting all women and men in the region. But despite my own reservations of the packaging, content and tone of El Tahawi's article, I felt uncomfortable with the lack of serious attempts to look inward, name and confront those attitudes, <coughs> norms, practices and relations that cannot simply be explained away by external and structural patterns, forces and processes. There is individual agency after all, and in the context of Iraq, for example, not all forms of gender-based violence can be reduced to the occupation. Now, over the past years, I have spent lots of time and energy as an academic and as an activist to argue against the culturalization of what are political issues, what are economic issues, what are social issues, particularly with reference to gender-based violence. I mean, that has been a you know, big motivation force for me. For years I have felt compelled to say and write, it is not about their culture, but it is about political economies. It is about authoritarian dictatorships and conservative patriarchal interpretations and practices. It is about foreign interventions and invasions. I know that the struggle for women's rights intersects with the struggle against other inequalities, which in the Middle East translates into, the str into struggles against imperialism, sectarianism and so on. Now, being based in London, my feminism certainly also intersects with the struggle against racism and Islamophobia. <coughs> Throughout, I have tried to not become an apologetic in terms of systematic human and women's rights abuses in Iraq and elsewhere. Yet, I have to admit that I'm getting quite frustrated, or not quite, I'm getting a bit frustrated <laughs> by my own constant compulsion to have to fight Islamophobia and racism in the first instance. And in that process, sometimes end up glossing over forms of gender-based violence, the political marginalization of women, and extremely socially conservative attitudes towards women and gender relations. And I would argue, and I know that I might make myself not popular here at by stating this, they feel that this compulsion is particularly pronounced amongst my colleagues in the US, based in the US, or some colleagues based in the US. Uh, and there are, of course, obvious reasons for that. I mean, as I was flying over here on Wednesday after the horrible bombings in Boston, uh, 
uh, well, I mean, one of the things that I was sort of very worried about or was I was thinking was like, I just hope it's not an Arab, I hope it's not a Middle Eastern, or I hope it's not a Muslim. Well, I think we, the good news is that it's not a Middle East, that they're not Middle Easterners, but they seem to be Muslim. I don't know how much of, uh, you know, how significant this is, but they are two Chechnyan brothers. Um, but, uh, so, I mean, I know that this instance, you know, the intensification of hate and racism, what is going to follow, depending on what we, we're going to find. But at the same time, I'm hearing and sharing the frustration and anger of some of my feminist friends in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Egypt, and elsewhere. Uh, recently, one Lebanese um, student and activist told me, um, Western scholars' constant obsession with refuting Orientalism is Orientalist in and of itself. And I would add, it is also ethnocentric. Although the same reaction clearly exists within the Middle East, where washing one's dirty laundry in public is extremely problematic, given the way gender norms and relations have been instrumentalized and the way also homonationalism has been involved, uh, has been evoked to signify difference, democracy and adherence to human rights. This is not an easy dilemma to get out of and I'm not claiming to have answers and solutions. I'm painfully embroiled in this dilemma myself. So one example I often give is when I'm asked to give a talk about Iraq, uh, one of the things that um, I should mention, and I do mention, is that there has been an increase in honor-based killings. But it happened to me on several occasions that I gave a talk and I thought it was quite a nuanced talk for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and at some point I mentioned that there has been an increase in honor-based killings and I'm speaking about lots of other things. And then later on in the discussion, I find that the only thing that my audience seemed to have picked up on is that Iraqi fathers kill their daughters. I mean, this is how, what is left. So what do I do? Do I sort of censor this out? It's a difficult question. So I don't have answers, but what I'm suggesting is that we might try to find ways and contexts to talk about this dilemma in a more nuanced manner and to sort of address it. And I also think that um, I don't think that all spaces are safe enough spaces to do that. Uh, I think that you need to, to feel uh, it's the right context. And I felt that a uh, keynote for Jim Muse was the right space to raise these issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want to just handle your yeah, I can. I think I'm, I can manage. So actually what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, if there are some questions and comments that I gather a few and then, so I can sit for a moment. I live in Cairo in 95, 99, and it was like the safest place I've ever lived in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's, a, it's very shocking to see who wants to turn it on as a result of these things. But my question to you is, to what extent is the mob violence in Cairo related to social and economic class and possible possibly sexual frustration related to the burden of the dowry system, the marital system, the fact that you know the people are waiting for years to save up enough money to get an apartment so that they can you know present themselves as a you know uh, a, a, you know a room for a simple room for you know a bride. Um, you know, to what extent do those factors play in uh, uh, economic, social, educational, you know, in the marital system? Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you sharing a part of your personal narrative and your activism outside of academia. Uh, I know you must have felt vulnerable, and I'm really glad that this is a very safe space to do that. I, I don't know yet. It feels that way so far. At least. Um, my question, on top of that question, is something I've been struggling with, and I think you hinted at it, is how much of it should we how much of this sexual violence should we contribute to economic factors versus 
problems of masculinity and patriarchy. As, as a young Egyptian woman myself, I struggle with this. I understand there are socioeconomic frustrations, sexual frustrations, but at the same time, it, it doesn't make it okay to, to rape women and to sexually violate them. So this struggle and this tension that we talk about, I'm interested to see what your response is. Okay, so I mean, these are two excellent questions that are linked, so I will answer them together. I, um, I guess I wouldn't make that same distinction um, because I do think that, uh, I mean, the distinctions in terms of on the one side economic factors and then on the other side sort of crisis of or problems of masculinity and patriarchy I think they are actually uh, really linked to each other. I mean, I do think that, um, so what, what does it mean to be a man is so much linked up to being the economic provider, being the breadwinner, you know, being able to, um, yeah, well, to protect. Um, so I think that uh, economic factors are crucial, very important, um, and I think that, um, at the same time, I don't think that we should be determinist in terms of economic factors. There's so many things going on. So, um, Susan, you speak about mob violence, and um, I mean, this is a quite problematic term, but I think that what it points to is that some of the violence that we see is actually, it's, there's not only sexual violence against women, although this has been the most visible, but there are other forms of you know, collective violence um, going on. So, for instance, um, I don't know exactly when it happened, but a few months ago, uh, you know, two young men who were caught caught stealing something uh, ended up being lynched by uh, a group and um, killed, basically. And and I I do think there are connections there. Um, so, okay. So one context is the context of chaos and lawlessness. And so that's where I sort of again sort of think about Iraq, you know, what happened after the invasion where you have to kind of have a, you don't have a state anymore, a functioning state. Uh, you have a kind of survival of the fittest situation. You have the looting going on. So that's, I think that's one reason we see violence, any kind of violence. Now the question that I'm interested in, and I, I have to think more about it, why is it that in Iraq there was not more I mean, there was terrible violence, but there was not pronounced or mainly sort of gender-based sexual violence. There is lots of domestic violence going on, and yes, of course, women have been harassed and have been raped, but it's very different than in Egypt. So what is it about <coughs> Egypt that it becomes such an important model? And I, I think that, you know, Denise Candiotti's argument is really important here. It's because, of course, women are much more involved in politics in Egypt than in Iraq. Mm -hmm. You know, in Iraq, women have been, although historically women were very much sort of part of education and labor force, but politically they haven't really played an important role. But in Egypt, I mean, women are there. They are in trade unions and, you know, in political parties. They are in all professions. Um, they have been part of the protest. And so what is at stake in terms of this masculinist restoration, there's much more. And how better to try to tell a woman that your place is not here on the street than at home is than through sexual harassment. And so I think what, what I'm trying to say, and I think, I don't know if you sort of noticed the kind of parallels that I don't think we should explain away the different forms of harassment in one way. So Similarly, in the way that I'm asking us, or that I'm sort of challenging us to look at Alia Mahdi's, uh, you know, uh, picture of herself in the nude as very different from the pictures later on with famine, I also think that, yes, there is orchestrated sexual harassment going on, and, you know, all my friends are focusing on that, and there are good reasons to focus on that, but that is not the full picture. And, you know, people who have worked in the countryside, who've worked in school, will tell, will tell you that there has been rampant harassment uh, 
in many places and that is not state orchestrated. Uh, yes, clearly there is an element of sexual frustration, but again, you know, other parts of the world there, there is that as well. You cannot explain it away with it. Um, yes, uh, I mean, education, well, I mean, uh, but education in, in maybe in the sense that I think what is happening a lot is that there is a kind of mismatch between, um, especially with the increase actually in internet and media and the sort of awareness of um, sort of images of women. Um, I think there is that as well. And I mean, I, I know that there's also a little bit of that happening in the Iraqi Kurdistan, that with access to internet and pornography and mobile phone technology and satellite television, gender-based violence actually increased. I think there's this. So I don't think it's one. I always get very suspicious when I hear kind of monocausal explanations. I think it is very complex, but what I like to explore more deeply is why did it happen in Egypt but not in Iraq? Um, I think that is um, something that I like to look at more. Okay, so there are several. Yeah, okay. Uh, start with this. Michelle and Tahiri from Lund University in Sweden. Uh, thank you for your open and critical presentation. It was very refreshing. Um, I'm interested at a personal level if you can share some of the methodological or pra practical tools that you have found most useful in negotiating your position as both an activist and an academic. Uh, thank you for that really um, thought-provoking, excellent, and also very personal presentation. Um, so I, you know, you said this, if you look at other examples of earlier revolutions in the Middle Eastern region um, where women's issues and agendas were sort of not put on the table and they were expected to sort of subsume their interests under the, you know, cloak of the wider revolution, it hasn't gone well afterward. And in reading this this morning, I'm sort of, is that what you're suggesting in Iraq, that basically things really haven't gone well for women there because their issues externally they were put on the table yeah. you know that was the point of one of your books what kind of liberation the u.s used women in iraq as sort of the reason to go in and be liberators but it wasn't an internal kind of struggle and it didn't end up very well in iraq if maybe i'm that's a simplistic mm -hmm. overview but could you say a little bit more about that and so in egypt since you've used this as the main example today because women activists are really more active and have been out there, and there's a long history of feminism in, in Egypt. You know, not that you're, you know, I'm asking you to prognosticate, but do you think there could be an eventually different outcome mm -hmm. in these revolutionary moments in the Middle East where women have really been out there, mobilized along with men? Might, in the long term, there be better, you know, um, a better future for greater gender equality, though it's going through a very difficult period, you know, mm. I, would, I would say. So what do you think, I mm. guess, mm. from the historic examples to the potential future, mm. could there be a better future? Mm -hmm. um, uh, my name is Nai, I'm a SOAS grad. Um, I, first of all, I think I, I, what I want to say to you personally is that I'm, I'm honored to have passed in one of your classes. Um, <laughs> actually, every time I read something for you and then, and listen to you again, I, I discover new things and I'm, I'm really glad that there is someone, um, actually there are, I guess more, but I'm, that I'm in close, I'm in contact and I'm in exposure, direct exposure with someone who is both an academic and an activist and it's, because to me, it has been a struggle to make the links between activism and research. Um, so I wanted to ask a question on the the possibility, the possibility of collaboration between the two. In in Lebanon, there is an ongoing debate in activism circles today. Um, it it feels like activists are so consumed with the legal issues that they are so consumed with either passing a law or uh, like abolishing a, a code from a penal code or something. So, but and then there's another trend uh, saying that well, laws are not everything, and that doesn't if you have a law, it doesn't mean that say domestic violence can be solved or changed or anything. So I was just wondering if there were any 
suggestions on, on areas of intersection where the two can collaborate, activists and researchers. What else can we do? I mean, I'm, I'm bringing up the domestic violence example because it's where the most, uh, the link between the two has been most obvious. There has been research, significant research work on you know, documenting domestic violence cases and the, the honor killings and, and the related issues and the necess necessity of the law and how, you know, why it's, it's important for us to advocate for it. So um, is there other, are there, I'm sure there are, but um, what do you think of other avenues of collaboration between the two? Um, Shall I maybe have another round afterwards? Yeah. Yes, otherwise I. Um, I mean, when you think about, I mean, this is, I guess, uh, both, uh, I mean, sorry. Jolly. Yeah, Jolly. Um, I mean, women and gender studies. How did it emerge? I mean, it didn't just emerge in a sort of political vacuum. It emerged as part of the, or as a result, or in connection, or in conjunction with the women's movement. So I never actually thought about women and gender studies as something sort of separate from activism. Clearly, it has the way it's been institutionalized, and the way, of course, also academia has been going. There are tensions and there are separations, but I, I, um, I strongly feel that they're closely connected. And that's why when currently I'm actually involved in Iraq in um, trying to facilitate the introduction of women and gender studies, I do that by bringing Iraqi women's rights activists and Iraqi academics together on the table, uh, but also by sort of linking them up with regional academics and activists. Um, so in terms of the methodological and practical tools, um, well, okay, so one um, methodological tool is language, as I already mentioned. Um, that, yes, I mean, I think there is, as an academic, I have to, like everyone else in Britain, we have something called the research assessment uh, exercise or framework, and so we have to publish in certain journals, we have to show our academic credibility. And so I have to do that, and that sometimes means that maybe you know, I have to sort of write in a more in a way that might be sort of more jargony or theoretical. Um, but generally, I'm on the conviction. Uh, I'm con. I uh, what? Generally, I think that um, you can actually express complex ideas in an accessible manner. Um, I also think that um, what I've been trying to do is to reach out to non-academic audiences. So there was a time at the height of the violence in Iraq where, I mean, there was one year I came to the States, I think, eight times uh, in 2006, 2007. And every time I was invited to give an academic talk, I insisted on also giving a talk in a community cent center, in a bookshop, in a women's organization. I felt it was very important to not just stick. And I think that's particularly in this country, which um, I think there is a real a big gap between sort of uh, you know intellectuals, uh, academics, and then your wider public. I mean, I feel that more strongly when I'm here than in Britain or in Germany. And so I feel it's very important for me to find ways to sort of reach out. Um, but then I guess Act Together was also a concrete, practical tool and method to combine this. I mean, I used the knowledge and the theoretical and conceptual tools I had in my activism and also when I would give talks. I mean, I, as you might have gathered from my talks and you might also know from my writings, I abhor dichotomies and the sort of black and white depiction of the world as an activist and as an academic. And I feel, you know, one feeds the other and strengthens the other. I mean, I, uh, I can't, I mean, I've, some of the worst moments I had politically was being in a room in 2005, this was in Istanbul, the World Tribunal of Iraq, which was sort of a series of tribunals. It was sort of anti-war activists from all over the world. Um, and, uh, you know, for, I was on a panel with Samir Amin and I was so proud to be on a panel with Samir Amin. And then for three days I was hearing people either starting or ending their talks with, we have to support the armed resistance in Iraq. 
At that time, almost on a daily basis, there were Iraqis being killed in bombings in marketplaces. Or, and I just thought, I can't do that. And uh, when it was my time to give the talk, it was a talk about the impact of the occupation on women in Iraq. I started out by saying, I cannot do this here. And I think it's really, uh, what are you talking about? Which kind of resistance are you talking about? And I had 300 people in the room hating me. Samir Amin jumped up and he said, this is not the time to be divisive. We have to unite against the US imperialism. And it was horrible. But you know, it was horrible at the time, but it really retrospectively actually made me much stronger. And it was, you know, my academic tools, I think that allowed me then to react. But again, it sort of fed into activism. And so Act Together, which is, has been um, really wonderful. I mean, there are uh, women who are filmmakers, there are uh, you women who are housewives, a really range of women. And um, sometimes, I mean, uh, I was every week uh, you know, on the street holding placard. I mean, we're doing this. But at the same time, we also organized exhibitions or day talks and conferences. Media. I've done lots of media stuff. I mean, the first time, I was a PhD student. I was asked by BBC uh, for Women's Hour, which is a sort of famous program. I was asked to give a talk about uh, women and the sanctions in Iraq. And then uh, a week before the program, they, no, a day before the program, they called me and said, well, we want to speak about children as well. Can you talk about children? I don't know anything about, I didn't know anything about children at the time. So I called all my Iraqi friends you know, how did your children experience sanctions? How did they experience uh, the invasion? I came to the program, it was live. There was another woman there, a psychologist. Today's program, we are speaking about British children's fears of Saddam Hussein. <laughs> I mean, speaking of rage, I mean, you know, you could see my heart going like this. Um, but, you know, it was live, so, you know, after they sort of discussed, you know, how poor British children couldn't sleep because they were worried that Saddam Hussein might sort of send some missiles on British playgrounds, and you had actually people calling in and uh, asking, what can I do? My child cannot sleep at night. Well, you know, you have to explain. And but then it was my turn to speak, and so then I managed to actually turn it around and sort of say, you know, what about Iraqi children? This the, you know, they have real issues going on. And afterwards, actually, people calling in focused on Iraqi children. So while I always found it, or I often find it traumatizing media because it can be very harsh. I mean, I sometimes find myself sort of between three men, you know, trying to get a word in. But I think it's important. At the same time, I don't want to do too much of it because I think there's a sort of whole construction of expert and I don't really want to get too much involved in that. Um, but also, I mean, I think that, for instance, the book Iraqi Women, Untold Stories from 1948 to the Present, I wrote it having a wider readership in mind. And I think it has, and I was very happy that it has been serialized in Iraq, so people have been reading it in, in the newspaper, so I was happy. Um, so, uh, I mean, okay, let me just go sort of a little bit more into Nays before I move to, to Marsha. So, um, I think it is very important for Lebanese feminist scholars to work together with Lebanese activists. And uh, yes, I think there is a problem in focusing only on laws. I mean, I think that's sort of a classic liberal rights feminism. It is important, but we know not only that um, I mean, as happened in Iraqi Kurdistan, yes, there is now a law that criminalizes honor-based killings. But does anyone care? Is it implemented? Does anyone follow it? Do women know about it? So, I mean, it's, you know, it, there has to be, there has to be consciousness raising, there have to be, you have to think about who has access to law, who has access to law. Is there certainly a sort of economic aspect to it as well? And yes, I think it is very important to make the connections. And I, you know, very much hope that um, there are links. I mean, there are some amazing, you know, scholars, activists, and I very much hope that they sit together. As I think a really good example in the region is actually uh, many, but one is the Berzeit Women's Studies Center, which is um, you have amazing scholars that are internationally recognized, but are very much rooted in local women's feminist activism. Um, 
and in Egypt as well. I mean, Huda el Sada and the Women in Memory Forum, I think there, there are lots of examples. Um, yes, I mean, I'm not suggesting that if women raise their voices and make their claims from the beginning that it guarantees that, it, that they get there. Mm -hmm. But what I'm suggesting is that this tendency to always think of the bigger issue first, whether it's liberating the nation, liberating the poor oppressed workers, um, you know, uh, getting rid of uh, a dictator, and then afterwards we look. We know historically and cross-culturally that doesn't work. And that was why I was actually very, very upset and frustrated initially when even some of my feminist friends said, well, but we are not here as a feminist, we are here as Egyptian. I think that changed drastically, of course, but that was sort of the first impulse. And I was sort of trying to understand why that was. And I think it has a lot, had a lot to do with the fact that um, there was a sort of element of inclusivi inclusivity and actually, you know, lots of people, whether, you know, based on religion or gender, there was a kind of collective sentiment in the first sort of 18 days. But when you look at um, Iraq, um, it was actually not that uh, women didn't raise the issues. Um, it's despite, uh, I mean, there was this rhetoric of women's liberation, uh, but very early on, there were lots of Iraqi women's rights activists who saw through this and actually who noticed that despite this rhetoric of women's liberation, no one was going to hand them women's rights on the platter and they had to fight for it. So, you know, I always give this example of the women's quota because often when I come to the States and people tell me, but Iraqi women got the quota, I say, yeah, but they got it despite US objection. I, you know, it was uh, in spring of um, 2004, a group of Iraqi women's rights activists went to see then Ambassador Paul Bremer and they said, we Iraqi women are actually the majority of the Iraqi population and we want to have a part in the new Iraq. We want to have 40 percent representation in all, you know, government decision-making uh, institutions and government bodies. And Paul Bremer looked at them and he said, we don't do quotas. You know that story. Um, so I don't think there it was the issue that women did not try to put the issue. I think the issue was that it was the first thing that dropped off everyone's agenda when we had the shift from human security to national security. You know, in 2005 and 2006, when sectarian violence and insurgent violence increased, human rights, women's rights, who cared about this? Arming, the arming of uh, militias, and we know from the white excellent feminist um, scholarship, uh, international relations scholarship, that there is a close relationship between the increase militarization in the society and the increases in gender-based rights and inequalities. Uh, now, but as for your question, whether I do think that um, in Egypt, because women have been more active, whether there might be a different outcome. Well, so my point is that the outcomes are very mixed. I think that's, okay, I can't really project what's going to happen in 20 years, but what I see now when people say, oh yes, you know, poor women in Egypt, I say, but it is a very mixed picture. You know, the very fact that you now have women mobilizing around issues such as her uh, sexual harassment, the very fact that there are men mobilizing with them, it's amazing. You know, and when I compare that to Iraq, that would not happen, could not happen there. So, but what I see emerging in Egypt, and I think maybe we've also seen it in Lebanon, is this really very polarized society. So you have on one level actually you know, um, men and women, and they tend to be younger, but not all, sometimes it's also older, who are really, really challenging uh, prevailing gender norms, and also, you know, often pr um, challenging, although they cannot do it outwardly, heteronormativity. Um, there is that. But then at the same time, the sort of more conservative and even sort of extremist parts are, I think, mm 
gaining in strength and intensity. And so what I'm seeing is really a very mixed picture and very polarized society. Now where that is going to go, uh, we don't know. I mean, what I'd like to think, given the pluralism, given the level of education, given the long history of creativity and cultural expression is that, yes, you can sort of push through a constitution that is quite horrible, but you cannot really silence and totally stop these very creative forms of resistance. I mean, I think that's where I'm putting my hopes and aspirations are. You know, there's still this amazing theater and uh, concerts and films. And I think, um, so yes, I, I, think, um, I think we see both. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Bana Mahfoud. I'm coming here from the West Boston, and um, I had a question and a, a brief comment. So my question is: You mentioned about the project where um, memorabilia or objects from, I guess. Iraqi refugees or recent Iraqi immigrants were brought together and uh, put together to show um, some aspects of their lives or different things. I mention this because actually something similar was done here in Oregon. I don't know if you're aware. And also in Boston recently okay. where there's a recent um, Iraqi refugee community in Lynn okay. and Lowell in Massachusetts. Okay. Um, so oh, I, I, what, what I'm interested to yeah. know is um, from an education and from an activist point of view, I know that the communities bring together their memories. What do you feel is what they take away with them? That's what we were wondering when we uh, helped to connect the faculty member who carried out this project hmm. in Boston. And my comment is, you mentioned about in Iraq, particular types of violence did not happen, whereas in, uh, in Egypt they did. To the level, I mean, of course, there's gender-based yes. violence. Yes. Yeah. Well, I just briefly wanted to comment that in my experience and my knowledge of Iraq, um, it perhaps did not happen to the extent because somehow, despite all the anxiety and everything that took place, the communities came together. Um, often people, even in the big cities, um, people knew each other and they would know who so-and-so's daughter was and who so-and-so's sister was. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. I'm sure you know, there were plenty of... Um, but I think that may be one reason to think about. And I wanted to thank you as well. Hi, I'm Katie Trell from the Open Society Foundations. And I just wanted to go back to what you were saying a little bit about Iraq. Um, from what you said, it just sounds like things are sort of stagnant. But, so what might be a game changer for women's rights issues in that country? What could women at the grassroots level and NGOs and government across society, what, what might they be able to do or want to do or be likely to do in the coming years that could change the situation for them? What, what might mobilize some action or, or push sort of past the blockade that they're facing? Chloe, I think I already said to you before, I'm a, I'm a big fan of your work. <laughs> um, my question is actually about kind of lessons learned from Iraq and, and um, what happened there in terms of women's rights and under occupation and in the midst of a humanitarian crisis. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or um, ideas uh, about applying it to the context of what's happening in Syria right now. Um, whether there's anything to glean, any connections to make with women's rights activists in that country. Um, particularly dealing with the influx of refugees to other um, to other states in the region. Hi, I'm Sarah Warrick. I'm from Rutgers University. Thank you, Nadia. That was always a pleasure to hear you speak. Uh, I have more of a theoretical question, and that may throw the group off. So I don't know if we want to do that. You can just ignore it if it's. <laughs> um, I was really interested in your, um, when, you, when you said about the cognitive, effective, and evaluative aspects of political culture, and the role of cultural <coughs> productions in that area, uh, I was really quite struck, struck with the paintball 
uh, exhibit in particular, in my affect, I suppose, the, in, in relation to him. Could you um, elaborate a little bit more on this so I understand a little bit more, and specific, specifically related to <coughs> conceptions of masculinities and femininities, uh, and specific, uh, specifically Candiotes, uh, masculinist restoration? I think that's plenty. <laughs> okay, so um, the first question was, um, okay, so we organized this exhibition and I understand that there were similar exhibitions in, in the US. What do I think people took away from this? Yeah, that was, um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think, um, in some ways, um, most of the people who came to the exhibition originally were people who already, I mean, who did not have to be convinced that Iraq was not just Saddam Hussein. I mean, it was a kind of self-selective audience. But because of the timing, which was, of course, not planned, and it was horrible, but because it coincided with the invasion, I mean, sort of, day after or two days after the opening. So all kinds of people actually came and the exhibition was covered by CNN, by, by lots of uh, media. Um, I mean, I didn't do kind of, you know, study into people's sort of long-term reception, but I, I do think, and I know from myself that um, just sort of hearing on the media, um, of numbers or you know sort of abstract ideas about people it doesn't really resonate so much so I want to believe but I have no evidence I cannot I want to believe that at least for some people it just helped to humanize Iraqis um, but I mean I think one of the problems that I also uh, face is okay so I want to um, reach wider audiences, whether with an exhibition or a talk, um, who are the people who are coming? Who are the people to come to see an exhibition in Iraqis? Who are the people who come to hear someone with my name speak about Iraqi women? Um, I mean, I really think that maybe only twice or three times in my career so far, I've generally had to face audiences that were totally sort of different politically. So usually it's more like, minor points, you know, I mean, I, I, um, I'm, I'm always hoping for it. I once had this talk in um, uh, <coughs> Colorado Springs. <laughs> and actually, well, I was invited to Colorado College and that was, went very well and I mean, no surprises there, but then because I insisted on having something in the community, little did I know about the community. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, um, so I was giving a talk at the World Affairs Council and so these were all either military people or retired military people or there were also lots of sort of quite rich business people and I was giving a talk about gender-based violence in Iraq and um, yes, it was uh, interesting. <laughs> no, but I'm glad, you know, I think it's important. So I, um, you know, I want to believe that it makes a difference. I mean, I would be sitting in my room depressed if I don't believe that it makes a difference. And I think, you know, we have to do, and I think, I do think that um, it is good to use different media and yes, I'm sort of more with the written word and the spoken word, but I think that art, culture, exhibitions are very important, and film actually, very important means as well. Um, Katie? Yes. So uh, what I was describing was a quite stagnant situation. What could be a game changer in Iraq? Actually, I don't think it's stagnant. I think it's deteriorating. Um, I think that um, several things are happening. One is that despite, I mean, there was all these sort of, you know, human rights, uh, uh, women's liberation, but there were other issues. Um, Demilitarize Iraq. Today, Iraq is one of the most militarized societies in the region. Okay? It is scary, the amount of weapons, the amount of um, 
well, I mean, both in terms of sort of small, smaller handguns and sort of big weapons. Um, getting rid of authoritarianism, as we speak, we have the emergence of a new dictatorship, and I think it's already there. What is different is that it's not uncontested. I mean, there are kind of many dictators contesting the main dictator, but I showed you the picture of Nouri al-Maliki when he first came, became president in 2006. No one gave him much, I mean, much weight, and people thought he's very weak, you know, he's not going to... But he actually outmaneuvered political opposition, and what we see emerge is a new uh, dictatorship, authoritarian, Islamist Shia. Okay, so it's also very sectarian. And as a reaction to that, you have um, also a kind of Sunni resistance that are unfortunately, as we, uh, those of you who follow uh, news, you know, the day there was a bomb in uh, Boston, there was another bomb in Baghdad, over 30 people killed, and that is actually, we hear only, you know, I guess if it's sort of above 20, we hear it, but uh, I know from friends and colleagues that it's almost a daily occurrence again. So it's actually getting worse. And in that context, um, it is increasingly difficult for women's rights activists and for women generally. Uh, it's different in the north, in the Kurdish area, uh, where the KRG, the Kurdish regional government, is very much using women and gender relations to demarcate difference with the central government. And so uh, women's rights activists have a little bit more leverage there and um, they have been able to push through certain uh, laws. But at the same time, you know, implementation is another issue. Now, what would help women in Iraq? What would help women's rights activists in Iraq? Okay, so some things that really, really, uh, I find really upsetting. Um, aside from the overall context, but sort of more specific issues, for example, initially there was all this money, you know, pushed towards Iraq, in often in ways that were not very uh, thought through. So uh, building women centers, I mean, you know, women centers and they had few photo opportunities with Condoleezza Rice in, in front of the women's center. No one is using these women's centers, or if they're using it, but not women's rights activists. Or you had these democracy training workshops, and um, my friends call it the five-star tourism, or training tourism. Uh, but now money has stopped, okay? Because Iraq is now officially a middle-income country, okay? So actually any sort of meaningful projects are not being funded anymore. It's very difficult. I mean, yes, you and women are funding uh, several projects. But it's not so much only about money. It's also about solidarity and exchanging of knowledge and expertise. For instance, to my mind, what would be hugely beneficial would be for Iraqi women's rights activists to, to meet up, not with the American gender advisor or the British or the German, but with their colleagues in Egypt or Lebanon or Palestine or Turkey or Iran for that matter. I think, or, you know, even with, uh, you know, feminists in South Africa or in Bosnia. And I think these connections would really make a difference in terms of, um, I, I think what is very difficult for um, Iraqi women's rights activists even more so than for those in Egypt, is this whole accusation of imitating the West. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, having this training in gender and democracy that is not really taking context and historical specificity and historical trajectories into account. That's one. The other thing, I mean, all the women's rights activists that I know, no, not all, but many of them, are very much at the forefront of challenging the regime right now. So they know that what would help women greatly if it would be greater pluralism, more transparency, rule of law, all this is actually not happening. You have a corrupt, I mean, corruption is so rampant right now in Iraq. Political violence is so rampant. Um, so I think that also, yes, yeah, some international pressure to actually 
hold the government to account in terms of rule of law, in terms of transparency, might be helpful as well. Um, I think it's other than that, I think sort of from the outside it's very difficult. I mean, I do think that um, many Iraqis do appreciate the kind of, you know, connecting, whether it's sort of academics being able to spend some time outside or students being able to go outside or activists meeting up. Um, I think that is really useful. But we can't really sort of here at Yale kind of come up with a plan. You know, that has to sort of come from, from inside. But at the same time, I al I'm also very critical of this attitude. Well, you know, that's it. You know, we're out there in terms of the military. Just let's forget about Iraq. Anyway, we have now have to think about, well, we have to think about North Korea and we have to think about Afghanistan and Iran. And, um, so I think that um, I don't think of like a game changer per se, but I think there's several things that can be done politically in terms of education, in terms of solidarity and facilitating encounters uh, with regional academics and activists. Um, Chloe, yes, uh, okay, so lessons learned from Iraq, I mean, on a very basic level, everything that we learned from Iraq means that it's going to be very messy in Syria, very, very messy. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the you know gendered implications um, I mean one of the things that um, of course happened with internally displaced women women refugees and you know in Iraq you have a situation where in some parts of Iraq there were 70 percent female headed households mm -hmm. and I suspect there are sort of similar things happening in Syria as more men are being killed and have been killed historically as well you know by the regime and what happens then these very vulnerable female-headed households. And in the Iraqi context, what we so see, and actually it was happening a lot in Syria, was the increase in prostitution, trafficking. And I think that's, I suspect that we might also see, um, you know, trafficking actually uh, taking root in, in Syria. Um, yes, I mean, but also I think that uh, in terms of the sectarian violence, I think that is, is unfortunately going to be part of the future of Syria. And sectarian violence is always linked with using women's bodies, women's dress code, women's mobility to demarcate boundaries between us versus them. So I also suspect that there will be an increase in gender-based violence and in kind of restrictions, women and, and gender relations. Um, Sarah. Well, I mean, um, so Denise Candiotti, uh, who is, I think, most, I mean, she is, of course, I think all of her articles have kind of, have become sort of paradigm shifting. And I, I probably know there's no uh, woman in gender in the Middle East class that doesn't have a few of her articles. Um, and of course, one of the things that she's become known for is the whole idea of patriarchal bargain and, um, and uh, what is interesting is that she's kind of moving away from that uh, herself. And, um, and so um, for her, this whole idea of masculinist restoration um, denotes a situation where um, because of the fact that, you know, women are very much present in the public sphere, because women are ver very much active in political participation, um, you know, we, we just cannot speak of a kind of routine patriarchy at work, but there's something much stronger, much more violent, much more intense at play. Um, and I guess when I was speaking about um, political culture, um, I mean, that's something that I'm sort of, you know, starting to think about and I want to sort of um, theorize more, but what is important for me is um, having looked at Iraq's political transformation and also looking at what's happening in Egypt is um, 
clearly, you know, although I have lots of friends who are very invested in specific political parties, opposition parties, and they, you know, have been working underground and in both in Iraq and also in Egypt, what really what I find so disappointing is the relationship to politics and decision making is very similar, which explains that a Marxist can easily become an Islamist. It's the kind of it's a relationship <coughs> to an ideology. Uh, so you can you have the ideology and you kind of have a um, you, you take it all as a whole holistic thing, and um, you don't have a sort of critical engagement with it. And so you can do that, with, which happens actually. And not only that, um, but there's also very inbuilt hierarchical authoritarianism. And so what I'm trying to think is, you know, what are looking, and this is again very much the anthropologist in me, not, the, not being so much interested in the content, so are these liberal uh, social democrats or these communists or these Islamists, but what is the relationship to political decision making? And not only you know, in terms of the, the cognitive, but also the affective one in terms of you know, sentiments. What kind of emotions are being evoked? And uh, to which kind of emotions do people react politically? Um, and yes, it is very much gendered in a context as you describe, you know, the whole whether it's you know with respect to the construction of the nation memory we cannot think about it outside of gender terms and it's gendering in it as well so it's both gendered but it's also actively gendering context society social reality perception self on behalf of james i just want to thank you so much for engaging lecture and thank you so much for coming. It's an exciting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.